Fifty-six, old and new tables. Part three of the book is dominated by Zarathustra's feeling that there is a challenge he must face, the biggest challenge he faced so far. There is a thought buried deep inside him, what he calls his abysmal thought, and he knows that it will eventually make its way up to his consciousness, and he will have to deal with it. He wants this duel to take place on his home turf, so he has been working his way back to his cave. In the last few chapters, we saw him climbing up his mountain, thinking back about the way he made so far. This culminates in this chapter, all the new tables, in which he essentially sums up all of his philosophy, all the new ideas that he presented. It is the longest chapter in the book, so long that I decided to break it into four separate videos. Before the big showdown, we join Zarathustra as he sums up his life. One. Here do I sit and wait, old broken tables around me and also new half-written tables. When cometh mine hour? The hour of my descent, of my down-going. For once more will I go unto men. So I first saw is no longer climbing, but sitting down and thinking of descending again. Does this mean he has reached his cave? I don't think so because Nietzsche later confided that this entire chapter was conceived as he was literally climbing a mountain. Since this chapter invokes the story of Moses, we can imagine that Zarathustra appears himself in the state of mind where Moses was, sitting on top of Mount Sinai, waiting to receive the tables, knowing that he will then have to descend and present them to the people. In the biblical story, Moses is so outraged by what he finds when he descends, that he breaks the tables, and has to go back up the mountain to write them anew. It is a traumatic moment. Zarathustra, on the other hand, doesn't see anything traumatic about breaking old tables and creating new ones. It is, after all, his life's mission, and he knows that in order to defeat the abysmal thought, he will have to create new tables yet again. In the meantime, he thinks about the tables he broke and created in the past. The tables he created, he tells us, are not complete yet. For that hour do I now wait, for first must the signs come unto me that it is mine hour, namely the laughing lion with the flock of doves. Meanwhile do I talk to myself as one who hath time. No one telleth me anything new, so I tell myself mine own story. He is waiting for another thing for the moment when he feels that he can go back down again amongst the humans. This moment will come only when they are ready for him, when his ideas finally take root in their minds. He is actually preparing us for the fourth part of the book. For now, however, it is about him alone. 2. When I came unto men, then found I them resting on an old infatuation, all of them thought they had long known what was good and bad for men. An old wearisome business seemed to them all discourse about virtue, and he who wished to sleep well spake of good and bad ere retiring to rest. Here is one old table. The idea that good and bad are absolute, and we know what they are. When he first came among men, says Zarathustra, he found that they all believed in that, and didn't think there's a point in questioning this notion. This somnolence did I disturb when I taught that no one yet knoweth what is good and bad, unless it be the creating one. It is he, however, who createth man's goal, and giveth to the earth its meaning and its future. He only effecteth it that aught is good or bad. The new table that he provided says that there is no absolute good and bad, so we don't know what is good and bad for us specifically. There is also no purpose to life. It is the job of the individual to create his purpose, and out of that, to create his good and bad. The creator can also create a goal for all of humanity, from which it can derive its good and bad. And I bade them upset their old academic chairs, and wherever that old infatuation had sat, I bade them laugh at their great moralists, their saints, their poets, and their saviors. At their gloomy sages did I bid them laugh, 
and whoever had sat admonishing as a black scarecrow on the tree of life. On their great grave highway did I seat myself, and even beside the carrion and vultures, and I laughed at all their bygone and its mellow decaying glory. Verily, like penitential preachers and fools, did I cry wrath and shame on all their greatness and smallness. Oh, that their best is so very small! Oh, that their worst is so very small! Thus did I laugh. Here he recounts the first part of the book, when he was dwelling in the big city, mocking and refuting all that its people believed in. Thus did my wise longing, born in the mountains, cry and laugh in me, a wild wisdom verily, my great pinion rustling longing. And oft did it carry me off and up and away, and in the midst of laughter, then flew I quivering like an arrow with sun intoxicated rapture. Out into distant futures, which no dream hath yet seen, into warmer souths than ever sculptor conceived, where gods in their dancing are ashamed of all clothes. That I may speak in parables and halt and stammer like the poets, and verily I am ashamed that I have still to be a poet. Sometimes, while criticizing and refuting and breaking the old tables, he would be taken over by a muse and be taken away on the wings of poetry. The words here invoke the chapter Manly Prudence, where he talked about being drawn upwards towards perfection and having to hold to his humanity to save him from flying all the way up, because he doesn't want to be perfect. The warm south, in that chapter, was a metaphor for the greatest evils, which he wants to open up to and then conquer, in order to get even higher. Here, again, he talks about being carried away to these regions of greatness, and expressing them through poetry. He is ashamed of being a poet, because poets, as he told us in a chapter by that name, are superficial and don't try to uncover the truth. But sometimes he needs poetry. Where all becoming seemed to me dancing of gods and wantoning of gods, and the world unloosed and unbridled and fleeing back to itself, as an eternal self-fleeing and re-seeking of one another of many gods, as the blessed self-contradicting, re-communing, and re-fraternizing with one another of many gods. Where all time seemed to me a blessed mockery of moments, where necessity was freedom itself, which played happily with the goad of freedom. The reason why he needed poetry was that he was trying to capture reality, which seemed to him as chaotic a sea of becoming. But here he hints that there is something eternal about this chaos, and that is the eternal return. Reality may be chaotic, and everything in it perishes, but everything that breaks up is eventually reassembled and resurrected, until it breaks up and perishes again, and so forth for eternity. Where I also found again mine old devil and archenemy the spirit of gravity, and all that it created, Constraint, law, necessity, and consequence, and purpose, and will, and good, and evil. For must there not be that which is danced over, danced beyond? Must there not, for the sake of the nimble, the nimblest, be moles and clumsy dwarfs? With this chaotic poetry, it could defeat the spirit of gravity, and all the constructs it creates and tries to impose on reality claiming that they represent something eternal and imperishable. Once again, the spirit of gravity is called the dwarf and the mole, the faces with which it appeared in the vision and the enigma. And here Zarathustra accepts it as something necessary, because through defeating it with his song and dance, it could go beyond what was thought before and conquer new realms. 3. There was it also where I picked up from the path the word Superman, and that man is something that must be surpassed. That man is a bridge and not a goal, rejoicing over his noontides and evenings as advances to new rosy dawns. Out of this aspiring upwards, the concept of the Superman emerged. Although history is chaotic, this concept enables the creator to give it direction, set a goal before man. It gives us historical points to aspire to, such as the great noontide. 
the Zarathustra word of the great noontide, and whatever else I have hung up over men like purple evening afterglows. Verily also new stars did I make them see, along with new nights, and over cloud and day and night did I spread out laughter like a gay-coloured canopy. I taught them all my poetization and aspiration, to compose and collect into unity what is fragment in man, and riddle, and fearful chance. The goal is the superman, and the superman is something that should be constructed. Every one of us has fragments of the superman, and we must work on putting all these fragments together. This invokes what is said in Redemption. As composer, riddle, reader, and redeemer of chance, did I teach them to create the future, and all that hath been, to redeem by creating. The past of man to redeem, and every it was to transform, until the will saith, But so did I will it, so shall I will it. This did I call redemption, this alone taught I them to call redemption. The other big idea in redemption was that in order to achieve full happiness, man must redeem his past, so that everything in it will be seen as good. You do that by making sure that all your old memories will seem to you as necessary steps to achieve your current happiness. To create the superman, humanity must do that to the entire human history. We must get to a point in which everything bad committed during human history will be seen as good as a necessary thing that had to happen for us to evolve towards the Superman. Now do I await my redemption, that I may go unto them for the last time. For once more will I go unto men, amongst them will my son set, in dying will I give them my choicest gift. From the sun did I learn this, when it goeth down, the exuberant one, Gold doth it then pour into the sea out of inexhaustible riches, so that the poorest fisherman roweth even with golden oars, for this did I once see, and did not tire of weeping in beholding it. Like the sun will also Zarathustra go down. Now sitteth he here and waiteth old broken tables around him, and also new tables, half written. Zarathustra tells us again that he is sitting there waiting, and now he adds that he is waiting for his redemption. He believes that if he manages to defeat the abysmal thought, he will be fully redeemed. Then will he be able to go down once again and live among humans, and pour his gold into their sea. The sea, as we know, is a metaphor for the subconscious and he believes that this new idea that is brewing inside him can pour gold into our collective subconscious, from which humans can forever draw happiness. 4. Behold, here is a new table, but where are my brethren who will carry it with me to the valley and into hearts of flesh? Thus demandeth my great love to the remotest ones, Be not considerate of thy neighbor, man is something that must be surpassed. There are many diverse ways and modes of surpassing. See thou there too. But only a buffoon thinketh man can also be overlapped. This goes all the way back to the prologue, and the story of the buffoon who jumped over the rope dancer. We learn now that he was a metaphor for someone who tries to leap over man and get to the superman right away. As we recall, it ended in disaster. You can't get to the Superman in one leap. You must get there by a process of self-surpassing in which you transform yourself again and again. This requires you to be hard on yourself. And here Zarathustra adds, be hard also on your neighbor. If you do indeed love thy neighbor, as Christians claim they do, then you must push them to self-surpass as well. Surpass thyself even in thy neighbor and a right which thou canst seize upon shalt thou not allow to be given thee. What thou doest can no one do to thee again. Lo, there is no requital. He who cannot command himself shall obey, and many a one can command himself, but still sorely lacketh self-obedience. This expands on the ideal relationship between neighbors. One should not rely on their neighbor for something they can do themselves and will make them stronger. 
One should not expect their neighbor to reward them for their actions, but act because the action itself is good for them. And finally, since not all humans have the power to command and obey themselves, the power needed to become an individualist, they must obey those that can. As he said in Self-Surpassing, obeying someone stronger than you makes you more powerful. 5. Thus wisheth the type of noble souls. They desire to have nothing gratuitously, least of all life. He who is of the populace wisheth to live gratuitously. We others, however, to whom life hath given itself, we are ever considering what we can best give in return. And verily it is a noble dictum which saith, What life promiseth us, that promise will we keep to life. Sarthusta's concept of nobility, first introduced in The Tree on the Hill, is another new table. The nobleman understands what a gift life is. Not the fact that you are living, but the fact that life can be made into something great and joyous. So they dedicate their lives to work on themselves, to transform into happy individualists. One should not wish to enjoy where one doth not contribute to the enjoyment, and one should not wish to enjoy. For enjoyment and innocence are the most bashful things, neither like to be sought for. One should have them, but one should rather seek for guilt and pain. So it's not like you can enjoy life simply by living it. For life to be enjoyed, you have to work on bettering yourself. When you do, however, your goal should not be enjoyment. Enjoyment is a byproduct of living a noble life, a life of self-surpassing. What you should seek, then, is not enjoyment, but rather guilt and pain, because guilt and pain point to the parts of you that should be surpassed. 6. O my brethren, he who is a firstling is ever sacrificed. Now, however, are we firstlings. We all bleed on secret sacrificial altars. We all burn and broil in honor of ancient idols. Our best is still young. This exciteth old palates. Our flesh is tender, our skin is only lamb's skin. How could we not excite old idol priests? In the Bible, the Jews are commanded to bring the firstlings of their livestock to the temple in Jerusalem and sacrifice them on the altar. Zarathustra compares himself and his followers to firstlings because they are treading a path no one has trodden before. He knows that the believers in the old tables would love to sacrifice them, to defend their values. In ourselves dwelleth he still, the old idol priest, who broileth our best for his banquet. Ah, my brethren, how could firstlings fail to be sacrifices? But so wisheth our type, and I love those who do not wish to preserve themselves. The downgoing ones do I love with mine entire love, for they go beyond. The desire to sacrifice, he admits, is in him and his followers as well. They did not liberate themselves from it by creating the new tables. The difference is, they don't want to sacrifice others, but to sacrifice themselves. They want to sacrifice the parts in them that belong to the old, rotting humanity, to make way for stronger parts to take over, the parts that will lead to the Superman. It is what he calls living as a downgoer. You understand that as a human, you must go down, so that the Superman can replace you. 7. To be true, that can few be, and he who can will not. Least of all, however, can the good be true. Oh, those good ones, good men never speak the truth, for the spirit thus to be good is a malady. They yield, those good ones, they submit themselves, their heart repeateth, their soul obeyeth. He, however, who obeyeth, doth not listen to himself. One reason why he rejects the current tables, the current morality, is that it is untrue. Those who follow contemporary morality, those who are called good in today's society, must be unfaithful to their own nature to do so. He wants to create a morality that is true to our nature. 
All that is called evil by the good must come together in order that one truth may be born. O my brethren, are ye also evil enough for this truth? The daring venture, the prolonged distrust, the cruel nay, the tedium, the cutting into the quick, how seldom do these come together. Out of such seed, however, is truth produced. Beside the bad conscience hath hitherto grown all knowledge. Break up, break up, ye discerning ones, the old tables. This is where he wants to draw from the well of evil, as he sometimes tells us, because this well contains the truth. Human civilization repressed the truth about human nature, branded it as evil, and forbade us to identify with it. By identifying with evil, one can liberate themselves from the lie they have been living in, break the old tables, and be free to create themselves on more truthful grounds.